So today and next month, I'm doing a two-part series on dementia. And I'm going to focus today primarily on the number one um, dementia that most people know about and the most prevalent one, which is Alzheimer's. I'm going to talk a little bit about the others, but the others will be next month um, that I will really focus on. Okay, so dementias, different types and symptoms. Okay, so dementia is not, I know this is hard for you guys to see, so I'm going to go over here. Dementia is not a single disease. Dementia is what is known as an umbrella term. So dementia itself is used to describe a collection of brain diseases and their symptoms. Symptoms can include memory loss, impaired judgment, personality changes, and inability to perform your daily activities. So under the umbrella, there are different types of dementia with specific names. So dementia, you can look at it as a cancer diagnosis. When you have cancer, you have cancer, but you have a specific type. So you may have colon cancer or breast cancer. So it's the same way with dementia. You have dementia, but there are different types of dementia that you will have. And again, the, uh, the prevalent one, the most common one that most everybody is familiar with is Alzheimer's, which is the one I'm going to focus on today. So 60 to 70 percent of dementia cases are Alzheimer's, why, which is why that's the one that most people are familiar with. And Alzheimer's, you may have heard this, is characterized by um, tangles in the brain, amyloid and, um, and um, beta tangles. Has anybody, have you guys ever heard that within dementia when they, okay. Let me just, as a side note, anybody here familiar with Alzheimer's firsthand? Um, okay, all right. Either somebody in your family, or how about you may know somebody who has had someone in their family or a friend with dementia. Okay. For me, my grandmother um, had dementia, had Alzheimer's, and my mother was her caregiver. And so um, I became very, my whole family became very familiar with it, more than my grandmother. Symptoms with Alzheimer's can include um, loss of memory, loss in your language and also a loss in visuospatial skills, which means that um, we see something and we know how to move around it or to walk through something. Visuospatial is when you look at it, your brain doesn't really, is not able to comprehend it in the right size. So sometimes you may see someone, I worked in an, uh, an adult day health program specifically for people with dementia with Alzheimer's and we would have the floors waxed so they would be very shiny and but what we encountered was some of our residents there didn't want to step on it because for them the shininess looked like water so that's what the visuospatial is the second most common type of dementia is called vascular dementia and it makes up about 10 to 20 percent of dementia cases and that one is characterized more by a disease or an injury to the blood vessels, which leads to the brain. So that one is more common with blood vessel damage. Symptoms can include impaired motor skills, such as walking, um, such as uh, driving or doing things like that. Um, the next one is called frontotemporal dementia. That's the uh, third one. That's about, that makes up about 10% of dementia cases. And that is characterized by a deterioration of your frontal lobes, right here, everybody has frontal lobes, and then temporal lobes farther back. Um, so that uh, also includes, those are where you see a lot of the personality changes of an individual and issues with language as well, um, not being able to speak. Fourth one is called Lewy body dementia. That makes up about 5% of dementia cases. And uh, Lewy body is a specific disease, and there's a lot of protein deposits which they have found on nerve cells. With Lewy body, you primarily see people that have hallucinations, they don't sleep very well, 
um, impaired thinking, and motor skills as well. And then finally over here, we have this whole other category, like most things, if you don't fit in one specific category, there's just a big box where you throw it in another. Uh, that's about 5%. And those are related to Parkinson's. So it's very common for people with Parkinson's to have a dementia. Huntington's disease, dementia uh, is common. HIV, um, there is a dementia that falls under, it's called Creutzfeldt jakob disease. And another one, Korsakoff's syndrome. So all of those also make up dementias. And I'll talk about those next week. Okay. So where did the term Alzheimer's come from? So it came from this gentleman who lived back in the early 1900s. His name was Alois Alzheimer. He was um, a German pathologist, and he had followed a woman who was his patient who had been experiencing for a large part of her life uh, memory loss and hallucinations and disorientations right up until her death at age 50 which even in the early 1900s was still young for someone to die. So when she died, what he did, because he was a pathologist, was he dissected her brain because he wanted to look at it to find out why was she, her behavior different from other individual people, particularly elderly people that he had worked with. So when he did that, what he found was what he found was um, she had brain shrinkage. So her brain was actually smaller than other brains that he had done um, uh, biopsies on. The other thing that he saw was tangled nerves. And I talked about a few minutes ago, so that's kind of common also when you do a biopsy on people who have had dementia, who have had Alzheimer's, particularly is a tangle in the nerves. Or me, you say biopsy, it's autopsy. Yeah, Sorry. yes, autopsy, thank you very much, yes, uh-huh. Um, and so to give you a picture of what that may look like, so here you have, um, I found this on the internet, so this is normal, normal brain right here, normal size aching brain. Someone with Alzheimer's disease, they have shrinkage in their brain. And you can see a marked difference right here. Can you guys tell that? Is it close enough? So you can see a marked difference right there in the size um, of the brain tissue. As a side note, um, I had a class one time just to, uh, this is very interesting, where we actually um, dissected a brain in one of my classes. And I loved it. I thought it was really the greatest thing to hold that. And um, it's primarily water. The brain is made up of about 90% water. And, um, so it's easy to see here the difference in the size with someone who has Alzheimer's disease. So what happens with a person who has Alzheimer's is there is a loss in memory, which we all know. So in the middle of the brain, more towards the back, there's this little thing that's called the hippocampus. You can't really tell right here, but it's actually shaped like a seahorse. And the hippocampus is where we store our memories. It's where new memories are made, and it's where old memories are stored. So it's sort of like a file cabinet. You make a memory, and your brain moves the memory to the file cabinet, which is the hippocampus of the brain. Now, with Alzheimer's, what happens is, the hippocampus loses the ability to make new memories. The old memories are still there, but making new memories moving forward, it can no longer do. It's lost that ability. It can't store anything else in the file cabinet. So what's common with Alzheimer's disease is you would have somebody who is able to remember past things they can remember quite often their childhood. They can remember things that occurred several years ago, but they can't remember current things. And that's because they're no longer able to um, have new memories imprinted and made and stored. So that's why people with Alzheimer's can have 
recurrence of old memories with my grandmother. My grandmother used to talk about um, growing up and kids that she played with on the block and favorite meals that her mother would cook, meeting my grandfather, things like that. But then new memories, um, she just couldn't hold on to things as simple as what she had for breakfast that morning. So, so that's what happens in Alzheimer's. You have the hippocampus, it's responsible for making memories and storing memories, and in Alzheimer's, that is no longer functioning. Okay. So with Alzheimer's, there's primarily three stages. Early, middle, late, sometimes it's also known as mild, moderate, and severe. And um, a lot of this information is from the Alzheimer's Association, which is, uh, which is great to provide information, um, as well as um, help to individuals and to families who have loved ones or friends with Alzheimer's. So the difference between these three stages right here um, is basically what differentiates them are the symptoms that you have in each of the stage. They worsen, the stages worsen over time as each of the stages, um, as you process and move through the stages. The progression also varies. So you have someone who may go from <coughs> early to middle to late very quickly, or you may have someone who may stay in each stage, you know, three, four years, and then move to the next stage. Um, on an average, an individual person with Alzheimer's, the average individual person will live four to eight years. But it can also, a person can also live as long as 20 years with Alzheimer's as well. And all of that, um, it's, it's, it's dependent upon a lot of factors. So for my grandmother, from the time she was officially diagnosed um, until she passed away, there was about five years. But it's not uncommon for people who uh, care for someone, have a friend, a loved one with Alzheimer's, with Alzheimer's, it's not uncommon for them to be able to look back and to see that it, years before there were actually symptoms that were going on, it's just that they didn't really um, pay attention or they weren't able to connect them with anything. And I know with my grandmother, I'll use her a lot as an example, um, she used to make simple grilled cheese sandwiches for everybody, that was what she loved to do. And one day she made a grilled cheese sandwich for my uncle and she put the, t the bottom, she put a piece of bread, she put a piece of cheese, and she didn't put the top layer of her of bread. And then when she went to flip it, of course it burned. And um, that was the first sign that my family thought, what's going on here? There's something unusual. And then once she went to the physician and they talked about a lot of things, then my family, particularly my mother and my uncle, were able to understand some of the things that had happened prior to that and suddenly it all began to make sense. So it had actually been going on probably about two to three years prior before she was um, actually diagnosed. Okay, so again, different stages can vary, um, different time lengths, it just depends on a lot of factors with an individual person. Okay, so the early stage, <coughs> Right here, let me go over here. Early are also known as mild. It depends on, on who you're talking to or what organization you're working with. But in the very early stages of Alzheimer's, um, this is why it's sometimes kind of hard to detect for family members or loved ones. But some of the early stage symptoms that you would have is finding the right word, a right word to call something. You know, it's right on the tip of your tongue, but you're not, you don't know what it's called, but you may call it something completely different from what it is. Um, or having name issues with individual people. And this is particularly with new people that you've met. You have a really hard time remembering um, what the person's name is. When you're introduced to new people, it can become um, very, um, it can make a person anxious when they're introduced to somebody new. Um, trying to have to remember who that person is. They may have difficulty in t with tasks in social settings or also in work settings, organizing, being able to complete tasks. 
those are some of the things that they may have difficulty with. Forgetting material that you just read, having to go back and read it again because you read it, you just don't remember what it was and you just read it. Losing or misplacing a valuable object. Now I know that you might be sitting there thinking, okay, well I do that a lot. I'm talking about something different and at the very end of this, I'm going to show you what is the difference between normal aging, memory loss, functionality, as opposed to this. But losing or misplacing a valuable object and again experiencing increased trouble in planning or organizing something, particularly for somebody who, who their whole life has been really organized and has been able to put things together, parties, um, all kinds of events, and, and they're having difficulty doing that now. <clears throat> and it's the brain is having difficulty processing and particularly sequencing things. What's first, then what would you do next, and then what follows after that. They have difficulty with that. So that's early and mild stages. Okay. Um, in the middle and or moderate stage, this is where you begin to see some personality changes, um, things such as suspicions, hallucinations, delusions, or a lot of compulsive behaviors. Uh, this is typically known as the longest stage. So you have the early one here, you know, not so long, the longest is the middle, and then the end stage is, is typically tends to be the shortest. All right, so this is where you may see a person become very moody who has never been moody in their life, They've always been pretty even kill. They, might, they may become withdrawn in a social setting, um, also in mentally challenging situations. I know with my grandmother, um, they used to go out to eat a lot, her and my grandfather, particularly breakfast, and that happened with her. She just did not like going out anymore. She didn't like being in social settings. She didn't like going to the mall. They used to go to the mall and walk the mall in the winter time, and it just became very overwhelming for her. Uh, and, and also too stimulating, the environment was too stimulating for her, it was too much for her to really comprehend. Uh, they're able to recall information about themselves, remember I told you that, because they can, um, uh, I'm sorry, they're having difficulty recalling information about themselves that's more uh, current, like their address or their phone number, or their high school or college that they attended things that did not happen so far back that you and I would not have difficulty in remembering, particularly with the address and the phone number. Um, I know that in my job, I uh, see a lot of people with different stages, and um, it's not uncommon to meet with a person, and they will tell me the same thing multiple times within a period of about a 15-minute conversation. They, can, they may need help choosing clothing for the season, the proper season. So you may find somebody that wants to wear a winter coat in the middle of July. Um, you also may see difficulty uh, in personal hygiene issues, particularly in controlling their bladder and their bowels. And also you would see changes in sleep pattern. And this is very common to see people with Alzheimer's who tend to sleep a lot during the day but then they're up at night. They're very restless at night time, um, walk around, um, just very fidgety, very agitated. And, and this can be very difficult within uh, the family setting because we sleep at night, we're up during the day, so their schedules get turned upside down. And you and I know that if you stay up all night, you're tired, so of course you want to sleep all day. And so it's hard, um, it's that internal clock that gets offset and there's difficulty in setting that back. And there are medications that can help with the symptoms. There is no medication that cures it, but there are medications that can help with the symptoms of the early stage and also of the moderate stage, not the final or the severe or the end stage. All right, so that's the mild stage. Then we move over to the final one, which is the late or severe stage. And right here, um, 
is where a someone would require around the clock assistance. So um, at this stage, it's not uncommon if, if you've had a family caregiver taking care of the individual. All of a sudden, the family caregiver cannot provide the type of care that the person now needs. And so sometimes an individual may um, end up in a nursing facility, long-term care nursing home, simply because the family can no longer care for them. Or they may be in a situation where the family can't afford to bring somebody into the home to provide care for them around the clock. That happens as well. Um, very low awareness of what's going on and their experiences and their surroundings right in the moment. Uh, changes in physical abilities. They begin to lose their, um, their walking skills and their sitting skills and eventually even their swallowing skills. I haven't um, had a lot of patients or clients at that stage. I have had a few. I had a client, particularly one gentleman, who did lose his ability um, even to swallow. And that's very painful for anybody to watch, particularly a family member or a close, a close friend. Communicating becomes difficult. They lose their speech, they lose their verbal ability to be able to talk. Uh, and they become particularly vulnerable to infections, especially pneumonia. And so for my grandmother, when she passed away, she passed away from complications due to pneumonia, which is very, very common in Alzheimer's disease. Um, that's why you want to be careful when they're eating uh, to make sure that the food is uh, chopped up really fine because we can uh, aspirate, which is basically you eat something and a tiny little, little tiny particle, a tiny particle can break off, go into your lung, and can cause pneumonia. So that is not uncommon to have pneumonia at the very end of uh, Alzheimer's. Um, I was going to say, okay, so they need around the clock assistance. I've worked with a lot of families who have said, I promised my mother, I promised my father, I would never put them in a nursing home. And then what happens is the care becomes so great that they cannot provide the care and it also impacts the life of, of them as well, particularly for children who are caregivers, my mother. You know, they're still in that stage of their life where they're working and they have to provide, you know, or they're raising their children. And so I've met with a lot of families who harbor a lot of guilt because they are at a point where they have to do that. And what I always say is we all make decisions in the best moment and nobody has a crystal ball we don't know what the future holds and sometimes illnesses become so severe that you can no longer provide care on your own or you can't provide the type of care that they need particularly if they need 24-hour nursing care which is also very common in the final stage of Alzheimer's Okay, so there's a lot of things that we don't know about Alzheimer's. Um, we don't know what causes it. There is uh, a lot of research that's ongoing. A lot of great research is actually going on right in Boston. But there, there is really not yet a known cause. We do know that there are some risk factors, however. Um, and we also know that researchers are now closer than they've been before to be able to determine a cause, which is really important because that leads to being able to, um, uh, to be able to develop medications that can, that can help. Okay, we do know that even though there's not, we don't know a cause, there are risk factors. And some of the risk factors are genetics, which were all the sum total of our mom and dad and grandparents. So there are some genetic factors in there definitely. There is a type of Alzheimer's that's known as um, early onset, which has a very high genetic um, um, cause in, in, in family members. And the early onset is where you see this early in life, in your 30s and 40s, which is uncommon for Alzheimer's. So we know that there is a genetic component. 
lifestyle can also make a difference. So lifestyle in that um, what you eat, how you exercise, um, where you live, environmental influences, which I think has a lot to do with things now um, in the environment which wasn't there you know, 100 years ago. So those are some of the things that can be risk factors. Okay. So here's some of the things that we do know. Um, like I said, there's a lot of things that we still don't know, but some of the things that we do know is that Alzheimer's is irreversible. Um, it's a fatal disease, and at some point, someone will more than likely die from complications due to Alzheimer's. It can begin, research shows us that it can begin as early as 15 years before symptoms begin to show. But at that stage, it's actually called mild cognitive impairment, or MCI. And this is where, as I said with my, with my grandmother, as my family looked backwards, they could see some mild cognitive impairment, some mild memory loss, or some mild um, doing things differently than how she used to do that. So that uh, is often the case. There's not a test that can determine yet um, if a person has Alzheimer's. Um, that can only be done after death um, if there is an autopsy done. And as I said, it is a terminal illness, and there still, unfortunately, is no cure. But hopefully one day, I hope in, in our lifetime, we will see that. Okay, so I talk about risk factors. So here are some of the risk factors that we do know. We do know, for example, that it's more prevalent in women. I'm not quite sure why. But some of that may possibly be due to the fact that women, women just live longer than men did. So because women live a longer life, then they uh, are possibly um, more at risk for developing Alzheimer's than men. Educational level, uh, we have seen plays a role in it as well. I was reading a study uh, a while back that um, I read and said that people with a higher education uh, may still be at risk for it, it's just that they can mask the symptoms better than someone maybe who doesn't have as high a level of education. So the lifestyle factors that we said, the, diet, the dietary habits, like the donuts that I love to eat all the time, things like that, that's not good for you, the high blood pressure, the high cholesterol, I'm from the South. So, your diet, if you're from the South, is nothing but uh, cholesterol. Take, it's great food when you taste it, but you know you pay the price later on in life. For previous head trauma, traumatic brain injury, that also um, can be a big risk factor for Alzheimer's. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, also known as NASADs, uh, which I don't take NASADs, but um, I can't remember, there's one NASAD that's pretty common on the market. I'm not sure which one it is. Um, but those types of medications, as well as cholesterol-lowering drug, lowering drugs and statins, they think that there may be a risk factor for those as well. Okay. Provigen, is that it? I don't, I can't remember. Yeah. I don't, is Aleve a NASAD? That's what I was thinking, Aleve. Oh, which is common for, yeah, for headaches, yeah, for leave, yeah. I, I took a leave one time, um, and I don't take it not because of that. It's a risk factor, I just because I, it didn't really help my headache. So I just never took it again. Um, and plus, we're just Tylenol people in my house, so. Okay. Um, so, let me see here. Okay. Now this I am going to go up here, absolutely. Um, so here are some facts and figures from 2021, the latest from, again, the Alzheimer's Association. And so some of these are um, one in three, this was from 2021, just a couple months ago, one in three people um, died with Alzheimer's or another 
type of dementia. One in three seniors, one in three seniors. That's a pretty big number right there. That's why Alzheimer's affects almost everybody, either in your family, either somebody that you work with, you know, uh, as a family member or a friend. Uh, currently, there are more than six million Americans, Americans living with Alzheimer's disease, all of the various stages. Alzheimer's and dementia deaths have increased 16% during COVID, during the COVID pandemic, increased 16%. Um, right here, Alzheimer's kills more than breast cancer and prostate cancer combined. More people die from Alzheimer's than these two combined. Between the year 2000 and the year 2019, between those, deaths from heart disease actually decreased 7.3%, which is pretty good, that's a great number. However, deaths from Alzheimer's uh, increased 145% uh, in almost 20 years, 145%. In 2021, Alzheimer's and other dementias cost the nation $355 billion. And by 2050, the estimated cost to the nation, to our country for Alzheimer's, is predicted to be $1.1 trillion. So uh, we've always heard uh, that there's, there's a big wave that's coming, especially in light of the baby boom generation. The um, large generation of been born, you know, within the last um, 100 years. And that generation has always changed and shaped every decade that it's gone through. And so again, um, moving into the final stages of life, the human generation predicted to cost the country $1.1 trillion. Um, over 11 million Americans provide unpaid care for people with Alzheimer's or other dementias. My mother was one of those. My mother worked during the day. When my mother got off work, she would go over to my grandparents' house. She would stay there until my grandmother went to bed. Sometimes at 11 o'clock at night, she would bathe my grandmother because I mean, my grandmother would let my grandfather do anything. She would bathe her, she would give her her dinner, she would give her her medication, she would spend time with her. She'd get her in bed, she'd go home, and it was not uncommon for my grandfather to call my mother three o'clock in the morning, that she had thought about it. And she was agitated and angry, and she needed, he needed my mother to come over because for whatever reason, only my mother could call my grandmother. Um, so my mother was one of those caregivers that you hear about, and also a caregiver that suffers their own physical issues later in life. So when my grandmother died, within a year, my mother had a heart attack, uh, she had to have uh, knee replacement, and she had to have her ball bladder. Now, a lot of that was because um, she had, she just had to put all those things off because she knew that you know nobody else was going to care for her mother. Um, and some of those things, the heart attack particularly, was the stress um, that she went through. And then finally, caregivers provided an estimate, an estimated 153 billion hours of care. 153 billion hours of care, uh, which is estimated to have been 257 billion dollars. So if those individual people got paid to do what they did, that's that's what this would have been. So that gives you an idea just of the vastness and the immensity of the disease and people that are caring for their loved one or on their own. And you see a lot of um, dementia caregiver support groups, which are so important because only a caregiver of a person with dementia can understand what the other person is, is talking about and going through. And I ran a lot of um, dementia caregiver support groups, and I would just organize them, and they would do they would run them themselves basically because you start to talk about those things, and it's to hear your story being told from the person across the table from you is really powerful. Um, okay, so, coming out of 
the last couple of slides right here. <clears throat> so are there some ways, we said that there's risk factors, are there some ways uh, maybe to, that you can do to help prevent? Yeah, there are. So physical exercise is really important. You don't have to run the Boston Marathon. But you know, a little bit of physical exercise every day. They ask the, the estimate is you can get 30 minutes in, I think four times a week, walking around the block. Um, anything is better than nothing. Healthy diet. Um, you know, you've got to watch your fat intake and uh, cholesterol, things like that. And it's never too late. I always like to say that it's never too late. You know, to adjust your diet. Little incremental changes at a time is much easier. Uh, and more sustaining than trying to make a big change. Regular sleep, you know, I think we're the most sleep deprived um, country there is. I think the average amount of time a person sleeps, I saw this, is about five hours a night, which is, I, that is not me. I'm one of these, I have to have eight hours and I can't function. My husband goes on about four and a half or five hours. So regular sleep, mental stimulation, you know, do those crossword puzzles and um, all those word searches and Sudoku, I can't do those puzzles <laughs> anyway. I can't say it, but I can't do them either. Um, but I do like puzzles. Social engagement, you know, being able to communicate with people, to get out, um, have great conversations, um, uh, you know, just to enjoy, enjoy yourself with other people, and, and stress management. Do you guys have any stress management techniques? Anything that we do for stress that helps you with stress? I used to drink too much. Thank <laughs> God that's over. Okay. All right. Well, for me, uh, exercise actually does help me with my stress level. And I can tell when I haven't had an opportunity to exercise regularly. And again, I don't want to go to marathon. But I love to get out and walk. I love to bike. And when I don't do that consistently, I can tell within a week a change in my mental alimentation. Um, so again, early signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's. Memory loss, misplacing items, difficulty in making decisions and in judgment, uh, mood swings, social withdrawal, confusion with time and places, um, repetitive speech, and remember I had said that I had met with a woman and within 15 minutes she told me the same thing for the repetitive speech. Um, and uh, difficulty completing complex tasks. So those are some of the early signs and symptoms. Now, I know you're sitting here and you're probably thinking exactly what I'm thinking which is, what am I thinking? Thinking. Some of that sounds like me, actually. That's sort of the stuff that I'm going through. But I can tell you that there really is a difference between dementia and normal aging. Okay. So the normal signs of aging, sometimes they are confused with the start of dementia or the start of Alzheimer's. But there is a guy, I just pulled this up online, I don't know if I it, I don't find anything. So memory loss, right here. And this is one of them. So people with dementia, often forget recently learned information, right? Remember, they read something, they can't remember, they have to go back and read it. They're introduced to somebody, they can't remember the name. The phone numbers are primary. You give somebody a number, you can't remember that. Um, but in normal aging, in the normal aging process, you have occasional memories. So you can remember, you can remember the event, you may not be able to, remember something specific about it, but you can remember the event. What language problems? So for people with dementia, language problems, individuals can forget words or substitute an unusual word, which happens a lot. You will hear a person call an item something that has no relation to what that item is right there. Uh, their speech becomes difficult, um, and their writing also becomes difficult to understand. But in normal aging, again, we have trouble sometimes finding the right word or forgetting a name, but you can still complete the sentence. You just are, you know, you just can't put your put your mind on what the right word is. 
difficulty with tasks. People with dementia often find it hard to plan or complete a task. But in normal aging, adults don't have problems completing everyday tasks. And those are simple things like showering, dressing, making a meal for yourself, getting in the car, going to the supermarket, coming home. Um, you can do those. With dementia, it's hard to do to complete those tasks every day. So the effects of normal aging. The effects of normal aging are, you don't know the exact date, or you don't know the day ever. Okay? Like how many times have, have you had to sign something and you said, what is, what, what's the date again? I don't know the date. That's normal. Increased time to perform complex tasks. So for me, I can tell you that um, 20 years ago, I could clean my entire house in one day. Today, I can't do that anymore. It takes me two days to clean. I can definitely see the difference there. It takes an increased time to learn new information. My job, I work with people that are 20 years younger than me. Oh my God, they're so quick. Um, it takes me a little longer to, to learn new tasks. Um, slow reaction time, and then also occasional forgetfulness. Those are all a part of normal aging. Those are different from um, memory loss due to Alzheimer's. All right, so that, that concludes our presentation. I'm going to do for time. Um, so next month, I'm going to pick this back up and I'm going to talk about the four other types of dementia under that umbrella that um, occur that are not as prevalent as Alzheimer's but are still really important different types of dementia. And they have very different behaviors because they um, are connected to different parts of the brain that controls different behaviors. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about next week. If, if, um, if you want to learn more about Alzheimer's, the Alzheimer's Association in Massachusetts is a great resource. Um, I've done some work with them way in the past. They're really great. They're great for caregivers to call for information, for support. And um, all you have to do is on, on the computer, just Google Alzheimer's Association Massachusetts. It comes right up. It's the biggest um, Alzheimer's um, group in the state that provides resources and care and information and support to individual people who are caring for individuals with Alzheimer's or just want to know a little bit more about it. Any questions? I know that was a lot of stuff to pop off really quick. Um, I have Yes. Uh, regarding uh, the cause um, of death, mm -hmm. so often I hear Alzheimer's. Is it mainly uh, pneumonia? I, that's very common. Yes. Anything else? Um, it can be, um, well, it can be something as simple as um, an accident. You know, you fall oh, careless from that. You know. But, uh, but pneumonia is probably one of the most common ones, and it's because in eating and drinking, also as we get older, it's very easy, if we don't chew completely, um, it's very easy for a tiny little particle of food to get to break off and go into the lungs. And that's called aspiration pneumonia. That's when pneumonia is actually caused by an irritation in the lung from that. But it, that's very common, that happens a lot. And in the hospital, um, when we work with families, that um, have a loved one. We talk a lot about if they have, if they develop pneumonia, and um, we talk about if they go into cardiac arrest or respiratory arrest. So if you go into cardiac arrest, they're going to do CPR to bring you back in order to get your heart beating again. But we talk about a lot of, you know, but that's still not going to change the fact that the person will eventually die from a symptom related to Alzheimer's. So we talk a lot about um, do you want to put your aging parent through the trauma of CPR, because that's very traumatic on a person. You know, it's it's meant to be able to restart the heart. So there's a lot of a lot of pressure, a lot of force that has to be done. So we talk about that with families often to think thoughtfully through those things, particularly if a person is, is at the end, in the, in the final stages of Alzheimer's. Yeah. But, <coughs> excuse 
excuse me. Yes. We hear that it often happens when you're trying to resuscitate someone, you break uh, ribs. Yes. Yeah. You know that older people just don't heal as rapidly. Mm -hmm. And hurting an older person has got to feel bad for the person doing it. Yeah. And how can I be doing this to someone? Yeah. Perfect. Well, you just you said that better than I could have said it. Yeah. When you work in a hospital and um, as a clinician and you're performing CPR on a person um, who is elderly, very frail. The ribs will never heal. Correct. That. Correct. And the, the chances are, and I actually I could do a series on this, that they're going to end up passing away anyway that and quite often it's going to be from the trauma that was inflicted when they were doing the CPR. So CPR, it's not like you see on television. They don't do CPR and you pop up and you leave and you stop at Dunkin' Donuts on the way home. That is not how that works. Yeah. So these are all, that's, that's great. They're very um, thoughtful, intentional conversations to think about when you're looking at the end of life, and not only for a love, but for yourself as well. You know, that's, um, I did a series last couple months called Advanced Directives. That's what that is. You know, letting your wishes and your values right. be made. Right. see how this could feed right into that. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Is that the Living Will? Yes. Yeah. Living Will, um, Advanced Directives that you fill out, you know, that basically states that um, you would or would not want um, CPR if you go into cardiac arrest, or if you go into respiratory arrest, would you want to be connected to a breathing machine? The do not resuscitate right, thing exactly. you get for your wrist. Yeah, exactly. So if you go into respiratory arrest and you can't breathe on your own, so what happens is there's a plastic tube that's inserted in your mouth, down your throat, through your esophagus, into your lungs, and then the machine does the breathing for you. And um, you can, you know, if you have a person who's at the final stages of Alzheimer's, that's very invasive. And they're going to end up dying anyway from the Alzheimer's, from something connected to it. And so I, I always say, for me, it's a matter of dignity um, for an individual person. But it's an individual decision as well. And best made sometimes with, with the family the most important thing is that you let your wishes be made known. And you have a health care proxy, and you let your health care proxy know what you would want done or what you would not want done. And in a given situation, my husband and I have talked about this a lot. You know, if it would, if CPR, if mechanical breathing is going to bring him back to a level where he can function the way he was functioning, absolutely. If that's not going to happen, then he said that he has said no. I don't want that. It's very difficult stuff. You don't want to be a burden, but the people who love you, they don't want to see you go. Yeah. It's it's a seesaw. It is. It's really hard. And, and um, I've been in a lot of meetings with families. It's really hard stuff. But these are things that you have to talk about early before something serious happens. Because when something serious happens, particularly if you have a big family and you have a lot of people, the odds that everybody's going to agree are very different. You know, that's probably not going to happen. And I've seen families, you know, disagree. And um, the loved one is the one who's suffering. And so it's important to have that difficult conversation now while you still can before something serious happens. You know, hopefully that won't, but to have a plan in place, if it does, um, that's the most important thing. So, I hope you guys come back next month and I'll, I'll talk some more about some of the other Are you going to get into dementia then next month? Well, dementia, like I had said, let me just see if I can go back here. Dementia is... the big term. It's the big term. It's the umbrella. Yeah. It's the umbrella, very good. Yep, dementia is the umbrella. It's known as an umbrella term, right? Just like cancer. You have cancer, but what kind of cancer do you have, right? You have dementia, but what type of dementia? So dementia itself, it really is part of the symptoms. Those are the symptoms of which type of dementia do you have right there. Yeah. So 
Alzheimer's was today, next month, vascular dementia, frontotemporal, Lewy body, and then I'll just throw a little smattering of a couple of others in here. Okay, thank, thank you so, so much.